Sean. Thanks, Sean. So for those of you in the NRES program, in my two decades now at K-State, um, I spent a lot of time helping out with NRES during the first decade that I was here. In fact, I was director for part of that time, so I was in the role that Dr. Hutchinson's been in, and he's been wise not to come and seek out my advice. <laughs> um, so a little bit about me. When I was 16, I asked for a recording barometer and got one for my birthday. So I've been a, one of these weather nerds since about whenever. I grew up in upstate New York. This is Lake Ontario up here, that big open body of water in the snow-covered satellite scene. And I lived within a mile of Lake Ontario in a suburb of Rochester, New York, shoveling on average 90 inches of snow in a place that had been carved by glaciers. And I was told, we didn't understand why, things shifted back and forth, but I was told as a as school kid that there had been two miles of ice just 25,000 years ago in Rochester, New York to help carve out those finger lakes to the south and the big Great Lakes and all that sort of stuff. And so now we know an answer as to what drove that. But when I went to Michigan State and then on to Minnesota, we didn't have a clue. We had 30 different theories. And so you know, I'm one of these people that's always sort of been interested in climate and climate change, and I put my vanity tag money where my mouth is, <laughs> okay? Um, just to try to give you an idea of where we're headed in the next 45 minutes or so, I'm going to try to give you an idea of what climate and climatology is, talk a bit about variability with Kansas examples, make sure you're aware of this brand new stuff as of 1996, the, the idea of using climate and science together to describe a, a field of study. And then we'll move on at the end of the presentation to talk about climate change with an emphasis on the Great Plains. And I'll answer the question, are we messing with the climate system enough that, to actually say yes, anthropogenic global warming is happening. So one of the things I put together is this diagram to try to get at the difference between weather and climate. So, you know, the weather on Tuesday, a warm little 95 or so, would probably have been higher up on this energy axis than it is today. And uh, you know, on a day where we get a pretty heavy rainfall, we'd probably be farther to the right on this axis. So each one of those little black squares there could represent a different kind of weather event. Cold and snowy, or cold and dry, or hot and dry, or whatever. Okay. And so I try to differentiate between those little dots versus this whole cloud of variability that we think of as climate. When I was in school, there was a huge emphasis not on the variability, but on sort of averaging all of those dots to give you an average of what the average temperature is or what the average sort of precipitation is. One of the resources that's really nice and available online is the American Meteorological Society has their glossary. And so you can just type in AMS glossary in your Google search engine and type in a word like climate and it will come up and tell you exactly sort of what the current sort of working definition is for various scientific terms. Suitable averages of the system over periods of a month or more. That time of a month is basically pretty critical because Ed Lorenz, the MIT meteorologist, identified that we've got a chaotic weather system. And the, even if we have the best possible models with the best possible input of the, of the initial state of the system, because the system is chaotic, we can only forecast out to about three weeks. Right now, we can do about seven days or five days pretty well. Sometimes better, maybe 10. Other times, not so well. But there's actual physical limit on how far we can forecast the weather. And so one of the ways in which you can think about a difference between weather and climate is just longer time to talk about the climate and the climate system. Okay. Okay. And then climate has broadened in recent decades to deal with underlying processes that determine the climate and this variability. So it's not like we have to go over to the statistics department and ask them, you know, how do I do climate stuff anymore? It used to be heavily based on sort of statistics and, and so on. 
In fact, one of the things that's still around based on our knowledge from over a century ago is the idea of a 30-year normal. Okay? And so, you know, if we've got a bell-shaped curve for our distribution, based on the central limit theorem, we should only need to get 30 observations, like 30 years of data, in order to characterize the, the climate of a given location. So when I went to school, what did you need to know to be a climatologist? You needed to be able to, to get, find 30 numbers and add them up and divide by 30. Okay? <laughs> And we typically did that to produce what's called a climograph, where we have you know, monthly precipitation averages and monthly temperature averages. And then we would interpret that sort of large swing in temperature between January and July and say, oh, yeah, that's a continental climate, because there is that large uh, annual temperature swing. Or we could identify that uh, you know, Topeka is a place where the precipitation tends to come in the warm season, but it's the early part of the warm season and not the second half. So that was sort of old school. More modern approaches would identify that maybe the atmospheric circulation changes in the second half of the warm season to cut off the moisture supply from coming up to Kansas. Okay. So you're going to hear one of my pet peeves now. Okay. One of the things I typically read in a lot of federal publications, and I hear from even some colleagues across Kansas, is that it's dry in western Kansas because it's in the rain shadow of the Rocky Mountains. Yes, precipitation drops from over 40 inches in east to less than 20 in the west, and here are those Rocky Mountains with slightly higher precipitation totals with altitude. But if I look up rain shadow in the AMS glossary, it talks about a location where there's a big body of water and then the prevailing winds bring that water into the mountains and so the west side of the, the, the windward side of the mountains is wet and the leeward side is dry. The last time I looked, there's not a big body of water out here. So we're misapplying the rain shadow concept to say why eastern Colorado and western Kansas is dry. It's dry because the moisture comes out of the Gulf of Mexico and tends to be pushed eastward by the prevailing surface winds, storm systems moving west to east. So it's hard to take moisture upslope into Colorado Rockies or whatever. So it gets drier because it's hard to take that moisture to those western locations. Okay? Turns out that if you really do a good look at how much moisture they get at 7,000 feet, on the east side of the Colorado Rockies, they get more than on the west side of the Colorado Rockies. So if there's a rain shadow at all, it's that the western slope is in the rain shadow of the Colorado Rockies. But I don't know that that's a good way to think about things because the water body's too far away. Okay. So Colorado, Kansas has a very significant spatial variation in terms of rainfall. My colleagues in agronomy refer to this as a wonderful sort of natural gradient to allow us to look at differences across space. And then if you go from Kansas City to Washington, D.C., there's almost no change in the amount of precipitation. And so we're sort of sitting on that eastern threshold of a significant precipitation gradient. Okay. So that's variability in space. There's also tremendous variability in time. Starting with 1895 on the left-hand part of the axis, this is the Palmer Drought Severity Index, where zero is sort of normal, positive numbers are wet, and really positive numbers are, are really wet, and the negative numbers, like negative three is severe, and negative four is extreme, levels of drought at various times. And so this is for the climate division in the southwest part of the state of Kansas. And my master's advisor, did a very nice study based on the data up through about the 1965 time frame or whatever. And he argued that the average was no different in this first third of the data record compared with the middle third, but there was tremendous differences in the amount of variability with a lot more variability during the dry 30s, the wet 40s, the dry 50s. And Dick Skaggs was smart enough to even though we didn't have the good data, to suggest that this might be possibly linked to ocean sea surface temperature variations. Turns out that there is a pretty good link there. 
Okay. But that's where our climate models came, come into play. So a week ago, I was asked to go out to the uh, research and experiment station in Colby, Kansas, to help them celebrate 100 years of being in existence. Uh, bird's eye view of Colby, okay? So I put together your basic climograph, because I knew the audience would be a lot of people who weren't necessarily really into climate and understand. So we have this strong continental sort of signature in terms of the temperature curve, and just like Topeka, we see this early season precipitation maxima. So what is it about the second half of the summer where there's still the amount of energy available to have H2O in the vapor stage so that we should get some pretty good moisture amounts, but we don't, okay? And it turns out that something blocks that flow from the Gulf of Mexico, certain meteorological atmospheric processes. And so strong seasonality is, is a characteristic of this uh, you know, semi-arid climate type. And then, you know, the th records, people like to look at those kinds of numbers and so on, okay? I knew that the Colby temperature record was based on one station in town from 1900 to 1957. So find 1957 on that graph. And then they moved the data recording out to the experiment station about a mile west of town in 1957. And when I first put this graph together, I thought, oh no, I can't really put those two data sets together because they don't fit, okay? So the average temperature is 52 almost, okay, with you know, 34 being real warm and 93 being real cold, but I wondered about what was going on there. And then I remembered what my climate colleague, Johan Fetema over at KU and others had done in relation to what happens when you irrigate and what that does to the local temperature record. And it turns out that there's a reduction of about two degrees Celsius, one to three degrees Celsius. And so I asked myself, I wonder what's around Colby? Is that a irrigation signal? And so here's a, just a Google map showing all of these irrigated circles all around Colby, okay? So I'm thinking, wait a second, that probably is this ramp up in the 1960s of center pivot irrigation or flood irrigation. And maybe the drop off around 1998, 2000 might be related to more efficient irrigation, I don't know but there's still gonna be a lot of transpiration off those plants. And so maybe we'll get to, uh, maybe that's a switch in some other ocean indicator or whatever it might be, okay? And I also put together this wonderful 114 year record of annual precip at Colby. And you can see that they got a lot in 93 and you know, we're crying in 2012 cause we're about, uh, Instead of 19 inches, we're down about seven, so maybe 12 inches in 2012, and that's pretty dry. But the experiments and research station out there got started in 1914 in response to this year, only 6.6 .6 inches of rainfall, and the amount of blowing dust and sand as a result of that very dry year. And I was fortunate to see a bunch of slides of what things were like at the time they started the research station out there. So we talk a lot about 56 and 34 as being really dry summers in Kansas. But for Colby in the Northwest, 1910 is the all-time record. And then 30 inches in 93 and 30 inches in 1941, so some big swings in terms of this highly variable delivery of moisture to Western Kansas. Another thing we tend to look at, less so perhaps over in eastern Kansas, but definitely so in northwest Kansas, is snowfall. You know, averaging almost two and a half feet of snow each winter. And I looked at this record and I thought to myself, gee, this is sort of normal. You go from less to more to more to more as you get into the middle of winter. But you would sort of expect it to tail off, but it doesn't. You still get big numbers in March and even some good snowfall totals in April. And that's because of a tendency for our atmospheric circulation to set up to bring what we call Colorado cyclones out of the Texas Panhandle or Springfield, 
Colorado, in the southwest, and they track across Kansas coming right across the top of Manhattan usually and dumping snow to the north of their path. And those are very common in the late winter and early spring. So this makes sense once you know what the atmospheric circulation does. Okay. And look at the difference between eight inches in one winter versus 70 inches in another winter. So tremendous variability. Okay. So we've talked a little bit about the difference between weather and climate. What about climate change? In this case, I've you know, shifted the shape of the cloud, I've shifted its location, and I've shifted the tone just to try to help you understand that. And I'm wondering if perhaps the arrow represents some sort of way of describing some metric of what that change is. Okay? So in this case, a change in the vertical component might be warming, and a change in the horizontal component might be an increase in precipitation. Maybe due to all kinds of events, or maybe just due to the extreme rainfall totals. That's what we're seeing in Kansas is more extreme rain events. Okay? Within the past few years, we have had studies done of specific events. 2010 in Russia, they were about over 15 degrees Celsius above normal for the summer. Yeah, wow, when you start thinking about that. You know. So they, were, they had a drought, they had tremendous fires, and some people said, this is so out of bounds with our normal statistics that it's an indication of global climate change. And then in another case in Wales in the year 2000, they went back and analyzed that data record where car, cars were being moved by rivers out into the ocean and all that sort of stuff, and they said it was so wet then that that was probably an indication of global climate change. So we're starting to see some of these people who think in the numbers perspective about climate, that maybe our numbers are getting to the point where they're outside the normal bounds that we would expect statistically. Okay? Tom Carl is now the director of the National Climate Data Center. And he published a paper back in 1991. Okay? If the models are correct, Okay, so this is 25 years ago almost. It'll take another 40 years before statistically significant precipitation changes are detected. Well, we haven't done 40 years yet. But it'll take a decade or two to see changes in temperature. Okay? So this is people thinking back almost 25 years ago that we may now start to see these significant differences in temperature. Okay? One way in which we can sort of see some of these events and ask ourselves how unusual some of these are is to graph things out and look at maps and so on. The record here shows drought severity starting in about 2004 and coming forward where the darker the reddish to orange color is, the more severe the drought is. And, you know, if you weren't in Kansas in 2012, you were probably pretty lucky, okay? But look at how that just came on in gangbusters in the, in the late June, early July period in, 19, in 2012. Tremendous area of drought throughout the central part of the U.S. In fact, it was the driest year on record in Nebraska and the driest year on record since 1895 records for Wyoming. It's the seventh driest for the state of Kansas. Okay? 30 billion in losses estimated for that summer period. Are we seeing more extreme events like that? Like the rains in Phoenix earlier this week where they got over three inches of rain in one day. Flooded, you know, the interstate highway system and so on. Well, a good way to answer that question is to look at an index of climatic extremes. And National Climate Data Center has been putting one together that talks about cold and warmth and wet and dry. And you can see since about 1970, the overall index has generally been going up with year-to-year -year variation. But there's 2012 there on the far right-hand side. So we're probably seeing more extreme events than we saw in the past. Okay? And one of the climate modelers who's been trying for a long time to communicate a message about just how much we're changing things is Dr. Jim Hansen, who used to be at NASA Goddard Space Flight Institute. Um, and uh, 
he's put the idea out there that we're changing what he calls the climatic dice or the climate dice. So instead of rolling, you know, with a, a six or a seven or whatever, over time we've changed the statistical distribution to favor more hot events and disfavor cold events. And so by changing the system, it's now much more likely that we're going to get an extreme event in the current decade compared with what things were like back you know, 50 years ago or so. And this graph just starts out with the sort of early distributions and the more you go to that dark blue or purple, the more you're getting into sort of statistical distributions based on modern data. We're shifting the whole June, July, August temperature record to be warmer. Okay. So the likelihood that you're going to roll a hot summer has increased over time, like 2012. I was fortunate as a grad student, not knowing really what I was doing, to go to a, a conference on climate change in uh, North Carolina in April. It was wonderful. The flowering trees were going and all that sort of stuff. And I heard some of the leading scientists at the time talk about climate change and what the drivers might be. And one of those speakers was the, the government climatologist, the U.S. climatologist, Helmut Landsberg. And he talked about this variable climate we've got from a number of different perspectives, from the you know, geological perspective of mountain building and moving large plates around to changes in solar output or orbital changes for the Earth. Um, he called that climate change. And then he talked about climate fluctuations like changes in the oceans and so on. And then things like iterations were 10 years or less. So the eruption of Mount Pinatubo in 1991, which cooled the planet down a half a degree Celsius for about three years, would fit in this category. And he was wise enough in the mid-1970s to say, hey, there's a category called you know, climate alterations were messing with the system, okay? And, and we didn't know very much at that time. So according to Landsberg, the idea of a climate change was something on the magnitude not of a half a degree Celsius, but more like the four to five degrees Celsius global temperature change associated with the ice ages, okay? And stuff that didn't change as much you know, like with an El Nino or something or whatever. Those were fluctuations or iterations, okay? So we can think about the old way of doing climatology was to collect a bunch of numbers from gauges or sensors and add things up and divide by N or whatever it was, collect and analyze the data. But starting in the 1970s generally, We've started to have Earth system science build physically based models to in understand how this whole Earth climate system works. The term climate science was introduced into the professional literature in 1996, not by climatologists, but by policy people. Okay. And the, one of the big questions is, what happens if we change the initial conditions for our model? maybe make the land surface more covered with snow and ice, or change the uh, reflectivity of the surface by cutting down the Amazon rainforest and making it absorb less and reflect more, or whatever it is. Can we run that model scenario and see if it matches up with sort of what we're observing in those places? One of the things that's really important in the modeling community is that we got better computers now, we got more people writing code, and so over the history of building climate models from the late 60s to the 1970s, they were really simple. Now they're getting much, much better. And when I stole this slide from Johan Fetema, it was, you know, a decade ago. I need to get an update from him. But the basic message here, here is that our ability to model and understand the climate system improves even as we add in more of the understanding of the complexity of all of that interconnections from the ocean to the atmosphere to the biosphere and so on. Okay. So when I was in school, climatology was mostly descriptive. Let's get the numbers and say what we've got. Or it was applied, you know, let's sell our services to the power company or whatever so they can get an idea of how much 
coal they're going to need to buy to keep us warm next winter or whatever. But we've now added this scientific category to climatology, where we understand the, the nature and controls and causes of all of that change and variability. So what are the feedbacks and so on? Okay. A good example of the result of using a climate model to try to understand things is uh, Siegfried Schubert's work that was published in Science a decade ago on the cause of the 1930s Dust Bowl. How is the system different? Most summers we have a high pressure area at the surface, the Azores or Bermuda High, that's far enough off to the west or whatever that it sends a bunch of moisture up into the central part of the US. But in the really dry summers, Schubert's modeling team recognized that more of that moisture went into Mexico rather than into the US, or maybe it went off the east coast, but for whatever reason it didn't go here. And when they looked at aspects of what was causing that change, what was different about characteristics, they looked at sea surface temperatures. This is for 1932 to 1938. The warm colors in the pink and the red and the yellow represent temperatures that are above normal. And the blue temperatures, mainly in the Pacific and so on, represent cooler than normal. Okay. Let's not heat up the Atlantic. Because, you know, when the Atlantic gets really warm, it perhaps increases the likelihood of a 1930s-style drought. It's what we, you know, learned from Schubert's study. Another paper that came out the same year in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Science by uh, several federal scientists, Greg McCabe at the USGS was the lead author, basically looked at the Pacific and Atlantic influences on drought in the U.S., Okay. okay, not to the El Nino, the tropical oceans, but to the non-tropical oceans. And 52% of drought could be linked to what was going on with two different ways of sort of characterizing the character of those non-tropical oceans, the Pacific Decadal Oscillation and the Atlantic Multi-Decadal Oscillation. And there's way too much detail here, that's science, Okay. But the big message is, is that we can perhaps look at what's happening with those oceans and perhaps can we make a probabilistic forecast if we know what the ocean's going to be like in the next 10 years? Is there going to be a greater likelihood for drought in the Great Plains or whatever? So here is the Pacific Decadal Oscillation. I love this sort of thing in science. Okay, this is the warm Pacific Decadal Oscillation because it's warm near where the University of Washington is, where the lead author for coming up with the PDAO came up with sort of that thing. And so the cool phase is when the coastal waters are cool, but most of the Northern Ocean is warm. Sort of opposite of what you'd think, but you know we're you know Washington coast centric or whatever at UW out there. Okay. And one of the neat things is when you graph out what this PDO has done over time, from about the 1950s, maybe up to the late 1970s, the PDO was in the cool phase. Then it went into the warm phase for a while. And some people would say since about 2000, since that Colby data record started to change, we've been back in the cool phase again. And uh, the cool phase of the PDO is very well correlated with drought in our southwestern part of the U.S. Okay, so if we got a lot of warmth in the North Pacific, let's not deal with those folks in coastal Washington, but if we've got a lot of warmth in the North Pacific, we say, may see increased drought in places like New Mexico or in Arizona. And the people I've talked with out there, except for this year, have been crying about how dry it's been in New Mexico for sure, okay? So when you map the AMO, positive or negative, and the PDO positive or negative. You can find that they were both positive for the 30s drought, but the PDO switched for the 50s drought, and some would suggest that the recent drought of the early part of this century is similar to the pattern for the 1950s. So this is building our modeling and our observations together to try to understand what's going on, okay? And uh, negative AMO, not much signal. But when the Atlantic Ocean is warm and PDO is warm, that's like the 1930s drought pattern. 
And when the Atlantic is warm, but the Pacific is cool along the Washington coast, that's this drought in the southwestern U.S., like in Texas and New Mexico and so on. Very interesting stuff we're finding out, okay? So if I think about climate change from a climate science perspective, I ask the question, has the system changed enough so that the output, you know, what we see in terms of temperature and precip is different? And if we think about Pleistocene glaciers, you know, the last two and a half million years or so, we talk about an ice albedo feedback where there's some, for some reason or other, more snow and ice that raises the reflectivity, so we absorb less of the energy, that makes it colder, next storm comes along, dumps more snow rather than rain, and we go through that, we build a glacier over time, okay? And so can we, in a sense, build models to try to replicate that? The answer is yes. This is some of Jim Hansen's work from back in 1993. During a glacial period, the amount of change in reflectivity associated with less vegetation and more ice had a forcing function on the climate system to, in a sense, change the amount of energy in the system to reduce it by about 3.5 watts per meter square out of around 342 coming in, so about 1%. And with those changes, there were changes in the amount of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. There were less. And so that meant an additional cooling factor associated with not a, a weaker greenhouse. All of that translates into perhaps temperatures going down about 5 degrees Celsius by changing internal factors within the Earth's climate system, changing the surface albedo, changing the chemistry of the atmosphere. Okay? So this is an example of how climate change might play out in terms of the climate system. And when we look at the record over the course of the last 400,000 years, with the present on the left and going back in time on the right, we can see the changes in temperature in blue, the changes in carbon dioxide in green, down to around 200 parts per million during the cold periods and up to around 280 to 300 during the warm periods. We're now you know, between 395 and 400 parts per million. And then when it got really cold, it got dustier. That's the red lines on there, okay? And this shows up with these repeated cycles, not just for 400,000 years, but here's a graph where now the present is on the right, going back in time as goes to the left. And you can see changes in surface albedo, changes in greenhouse gases, in the, so the forcing changed. And as a result, we put that into our climate models and we get, in a sense, calculated changes in temperature versus observed changes from various proxy information. Okay. I mentioned earlier that when I went to school, there wasn't a well-understood mechanism for driving these glacial periods, this major climate change. When I was in the master's and PhD program at a couple different universities, we started drilling the oceans to pull up ice, uh, sea, sea cores that gave us this indication that a major factor in producing the glaciers was an area in far northeast Canada, in the, uh, what's referred to as the Ungava Peninsula. It turns out we're not changing how warm or cold the sun is or how much energy we get from the sun. It turns out that we just had less sunshine in the summertime in this place in northeast Canada. And that lower amount of solar energy allowed the snow that had been there in the winter to persist throughout the summer. And if you have snow to start the next cold season, you can build on that. And so this is what we think was sort of the key spot to start building our large continental glaciers in far northeast Canada. And so that change in the surface properties, input that into the model, and you can basically build another ice age in your model. Okay, okay so climate science help us understand the past, can also perhaps help us understand the future. The World Meteorological Organization analyzes greenhouse gas levels 
and puts a report out every year. And the brand new bulletin that was announced earlier this week says that between 2012 and 2013, the increase was almost three parts per million. That's the largest increase from one year to the next we've ever seen in terms of greenhouse gases in our atmosphere. The best record we've got dates back to the first international geophysical year when a guy named Keeling decided, hey, I'm going to go up to 10,000 feet on Mauna Loa and put a carbon dioxide, sen carbon dioxide sensor up there. Huh? Okay. So we start collecting this data record. And fortunately, we've been able to get funding to keep that record going. It is one of the best records of how things are changing on our planet, the so-called Keeling curve. And if you extrapolate just from the first few years, you'd expect the increase to go you know, at a given sort of linear increase. But we seem to be using more fossil fuels because there are more of us using more energy, and so our rate of increase continues to go up and up, so that last year had the greatest increase of all. Okay. I'm about to show you what I think is the, the most scary physical sl science slide I can show you related to how the planet functions. It is an indication of how much CO2 will remain in the atmosphere at various times. So if we somehow tag a CO2 molecules with some red and blue paint to indicate another institution down the road or whatever, and we put 100 of those red and blue CO2 molecules up there, within 20 years, there'll still be about half of them in the atmosphere. And if we come back in 100 years, so I have to ask my kids, grandkids to do this or whatever, there'll still be about a third of those Jayhawk CO2 molecules up there, okay? And if we come back in a thousand years, they'll still be 19%, okay? So what we've already done is gonna be around for a long time, and we're on a trajectory to continue. We're on a trajectory to continue to add more and more, and we don't seem to be doing anything to stop that, okay? So if we look at somebody who tries to answer the question, well, how much energy is coming into our system from the sun? Not very, very much, just year after year we get. And how much are we losing the purple lines showing the long wave or earth emitted radiation? It turns out our system is out of balance right now, okay? So this is an older article at the top and a recent update basically gives you the same thing. But the bottom line is there's an imbalance. We have more energy in our system now that's making it warmer, and our attempts to try to lose that energy are not able to keep up with how much we're storing. Okay? So you might think, oh, that's, that's global warming. Well, here's another scary slide for you. Okay? If we look at where that extra energy is going, the vast, vast majority, more than 85% of it is going into the oceans. It was first in the surface ocean, and now we've got good, good evidence that it's going down at least 1,000 meters into the oceans. So we're storing a lot of energy in our oceans. Well, that's what they do. But when we talk about global temperature and whether or not the planetary temperature is going up or not, I think of um, a Michael Frank's tune where he talks about popsicle toes. If I wanted to get my wife's body temperature, I probably wouldn't measure her toe temperature. But if we want to take a measure of the whole Earth system, should we measure what's changing in the oceans, the major part of the body, or perhaps cold feet? Okay. So our measurement of the atmospheric temperature may not be the best indicator of what's happening to the whole system. Okay. Back in uh, 2005, Jim Hansen, who's written extensively on the subject of global climate change, talked about understanding these glacial forcings, these paleo forcings, okay? And the feedbacks or the indirect sort of changes. Internal stuff has caused almost all of our historical geologic temperature changes, these feedbacks during the Pleistocene. Climate is very sensitive to small forcings. And so he, he looked at that. 
But then he concluded with the idea that another ice age cannot occur unless humans become extinct because we've changed the system so much. Humans are now in control of global climate. How many of you heard this back in 2005? Very few, probably. Okay, an important message from the climate modeling, climate science people. Okay, so we're in control of the global climate. What are we going to do about it? Interesting sorts of questions. So I think we've been messing with things. Okay. okay. So to wrap things up, climate is what you expect. Weather is what you get. Okay. So today's weather may be a little bit below what we might expect for you know, the 11th of September. And the stuff on Monday may have been a little bit above what we might expect. Okay. So some other phrases comparing weather and climate. Okay. So I put the jacket on, not to sound more scholarly or whatever, but because it's a little cool out there. <laughs> oh, okay, okay. So I've entered, introduced the idea that when we think about climatology, there was this older mindset where you, you, you get the statistician involved and you put together numbers that talk about all of these uh, extremes and averages and all that sort of stuff. And then we've got this newer si mindset that we study this system and try to model it using computer programs and so on. Help us refine our understanding of the system and maybe make predictions about what may th things might be like in the future. And from my perspective, I think we've been messing with the system quite a bit. Thank you. I've left five minutes for questions, so have at it. Anybody? Yes? Um, as far as drought goes, as far as for the, the West Coast, how, what, do you, what do you think is pre what is causing that extreme drought in like, the southern, like southern California? Okay, okay, okay. So the, the actual cause can be traced from, okay, here's some observations. It's really dry. It hasn't rained a while to patterns of atmospheric circulation that are abnormal. And it turns out that a ridge not of warmer temperatures at the surface but higher pressure aloft has tended to steer weather systems that would bring moisture up into British Columbia rather than down into California. So we know that much, that the, you know, the, the, the storms haven't gone to California and then to Arizona or whatever, except for moisture coming up out of the Gulf of California for the Arizona rains. So, but going beyond that to say, why was there this persistent ridge over California and out into the uh, waters of the Eastern Pacific? We're not sure, okay? We don't really know what's going on there. But if you think back to the winter and this polar vortex that came down, mm -hmm. same weather pattern. Stuff went up into Alaska and came down into the eastern part of the U.S. So it's been abnormally cool in the eastern U.S. for much of this year and abnormally warm and also dry in California. So do you think eventually it'll kind of shift or kind of flip in a way? Californians are sure praying that that's going to happen. But, and, and to some extent, we, we've seen that. One of the things I teach in my classes is that when things are unusual in the atmosphere, our models don't do so well. So when we've got a major hurricane in the Atlantic and another one in the Eastern Pacific, I tend not to believe the forecasts, okay, because there's unusual stuff going on. What's happening in the Arctic right now with extended periods of open water as opposed to ice cover is very unusual. And while we can try to model that, we don't have observational data to suggest how well the models are going to play out. So we're pushing the system into new states that we haven't seen before. Other questions? Yes? Um, what do you think about what the ocean temperatures are going to be like? Do you think that uh, water levels are going to be rising? So s ocean levels are rising, and there's two causes to that, and they're about equal so far. One of them is just warmer water takes up more space. The other is that as we've warmed things, we've melted continental glaciers, alpine glaciers, and so on. And so that's also led to a slight rise in sea level. Melting the sea ice doesn't matter because it was already in the water to begin with. So it's, it's ice from on the land that's melting and then the thermal expansion of the water. Jim. Um, just a few months ago, the Kansas Geological Survey published uh, a paper 
uh, droughts going back about seven, eight hundred years, and this was like tree ring data, that sort of stuff. Yes. The thing that I saw, there were some really long periods of drought that made you know our thirties and fifties look real wimpy. And things that last what forty, yeah. fifty years. Yeah. What about those things? So there was a real good paper published in one of the meteorological journals in 1998, 2,000 year record of, uh, of drought and climate change in the Great Plains. And what the guys just did at the Kansas Geologic Survey was hone that in for Kansas. But the message is the same. If you think that the 1930s or the 1950s droughts were bad, you just don't have a clue compared with uh, the things that may have lasted 30 years as opposed to 8 to 10 or whatever it might be. And so, yeah, it's a, that, so our, our fluctuations in the past have been bigger. And there's, there's this sort of common sort of thing in all of the physical understanding of the Earth system. If you think the floods in Boulder, Lyons, Colorado a year ago were big, just wait. There'll be something bigger but rarer sometime in the future. And so we just have to wait for that really rare big event to happen. And maybe we're pushing the system to produce some higher frequency of those rare events as a result of the changes we're doing. Any other questions people might have? Okay. Well, thank you. Have a good day.